Hello everyone and welcome back to How I Became. Now we've just finished our latest podcast. George, do you want to come in? Hello. Uh, how's it going? All good, man. All good, good, good. So after this podcast, we're now going to go film our first interview, our first in real life interview, isn't it? Mm, yeah, with uh, Adnan from Car Throttle. That's the one, yeah. yeah. So Adnan, based in central London, we're going to go to his offices uh, and this is the first, like I said, the first interview that we're doing kind of in real life. So if you could leave below kind of your comments, your thoughts on, on how we kind of format this interview, we're probably not going to do any uh, of me talking. We've only got one of these lapel microphones for now. If you let me know your thoughts in the comments below, we will take that into account for the next one. But for now, let's get into the interview. The name Car Throttle and the story behind it is actually um, quite a strange one because Car Throttle actually potentially might not have been called Car Throttle had it not been for me uh, actually thinking about the name that I really wanted to give to the business. So I was in my university bedroom. Um, I just started at UCL, so I was studying economics. And um, prior to joining um, UCL, I had run a kind of small blog for a couple of years. Um, it had a couple of thousand RSS subscribers. It was doing, I think, up to 100,000 unique visitors a month. So it had a, a scale of some sort, and we were making money from ads. And I ran that for two years, and I sold it. And when I sold it, I had really started to understand how to build a community and how to build an audience. But my real life passion has always been cars. And I've said this like a few times now, but I used to watch Top Gear every single Sunday night. But between Monday and Saturday, there was absolutely nothing for people like me, like this new generation of car enthusiasts that was pretty much addicted to the Internet. Um, and so I sat there in my university bedroom going, oh, you know what, let me start a blog very similar to what I had before, but just focused around cars. And so the, the main criteria for me was it has to have car in it for search engine reasons, and it has to have any other word after. So I think I had like a short list of 20 names, and the final two were car throttle and car oomph. I don't know why the hell I was going to call it car oomph. So anyway, um, I um, thankfully decided not to be an idiot, and I went with car throttle. And even, I mean, even in the early days, people on Reddit were like, car throttle, it doesn't mean anything. Like, it's, it's a car's throttle or the throttle of a car, but a car throttle, it's just, you know. But the thing with names is that, honestly, it really doesn't matter ultimately what you call your company. You can call it Google or Yahoo or whatever it is, so long as what you're creating has the USP. Names, to be honest, don't really matter that much. And you can find some really clever names, but the naming structure is not important. Um, so that was the start of it, and the start of Car Throttle essentially was a blog that then turned into a YouTube channel, that then turned into this Facebook network, that then turned into a media business. Yeah, the aim behind the first videos that we ever created was actually very simple. It was, how do we create a YouTube video for someone like me? I am a lazy university student who is obsessed with cars, who is literally scouring the depths of YouTube. And at that point, you've got to remember, the only people that were producing video content regularly were Autocar, maybe a couple of the other magazines, and Top Gear who were basically recutting their TV episodes. So for like the YouTube generation, which was just starting to happen in 2010 when I first started getting into it, the only people that were doing it well were gamers. There was nothing else. So for us it was, right, for the gaming audience that watch gaming videos, what can we do for the car enthusiasts that want to watch car videos? So I called up my mate, from school who I knew had kind of basically videoed like football matches. <laughs> I was like, perfect, he knows how to hold a camera. That's, that's him qualified. Um, and I said, right, I've got an invite, which came really out of the blue to my inbox and it was from the Volvo press agency. And they said, hey, we've seen your blog. Do you want to come and drive one of our cars? And I said, what if I videoed one of your cars? And they said, if you want. I think they were like, this idiot. All right, go, go for it. Um, let's see what tat you can put out. So we rocked up there. I remember going into PC World the day before because I didn't have a video camera. I think at that point I had an iPhone 3G, but it recorded, I don't know what the resolution of the 3G phone, maybe it didn't even record video, I don't know. Um, we went into to PC World and I bought this flip out Panasonic camera, 500 quid, it was literally you know, the ones that you take on holiday. So we get to this launch and it's us and like TV broadcast crews who have got like these massive bloody rigs. So my mate was a bit like, oh, I feel a bit awkward about this. I was like, you know what, just relax, fine. Let's just go out and shoot. And we bought one of those suction mounts as well. Uh, we created two videos. One of them was about the Volvo S60 R design. The other one was V60, which is the estate. Um, edited them. And I loved that part of the process. I, was, I sat next to him at his house while we were editing. Uh, 
I still take a lot of interest in that to this day, sitting with the guys, making sure that we're all in agreement as to what the best angle is and what things should be cut, what things should be left in, the treatments that we should give each of these videos because that part of the brand has always been me from day one. So we released the two videos, they got over 100,000 views and that's when we knew we had something on our hands. And from there it was a snowball. Uh, once we had proven it with Volvo, I remember the next manufacturer we hit up was Mitsubishi. And I said, hey, can I get a car? Ideally um, uh, an Evo. And they were like, no. <laughs> Try this Colt Rally Art, which was like their, I think it was a 1.5 litre turbo. For me, that was amazing because I was, I, I was driving a one litre Toyota Yaris. So to get like something which was a bit more punchy, I was like, oh my God, this car is amazing. So I drove it, created another 10 minute video that got, again, over 100,000 views, I think. Then got a Mitsubishi ASX, similar kind of story, then got a Honda CRZ. So we were getting quite a lot of views from day one. I think because, again, there were, our USP was, we were the only people doing it in a more youthful way. Like there was one scene with the ASX where I, I went to go and play tennis and we were messing around, but trying to present these cars in a certain way that was relevant for youthful audiences. We, we went a step further and started to produce like music videos. I don't know if you even remember, that was way back in the day, produced music videos about cars and that kind of earned us. And that got us some bad rep with the industry. As you know, with automotive, they're very conscious of pushing the boat out and doing things that are too extreme. And we definitely came up against people in the industry that thought that we were essentially young idiots that didn't know what we were doing and that were destroying brand image and reputation, which to be honest, in a certain way, we probably didn't approach it in the right way. We didn't educate the brands about what it was that we were trying to do there, which was showing off their cars to a new audience. Um, so kind of got wrapped around the knuckles from a couple of brands. And uh, before we knew it, when Alex joined full time from Autocar, we then started to settle on a very good routine of things that worked. And the things that worked were educational series, whether it was via um, project build series or whatnot, humor and entertainment via listicles and via skits, of which we've got a great one coming out tonight actually. Um, all the way through to reviews, which we don't do a lot of because we don't consider ourselves a reviews channel. Car Throttle is around car culture and everything we do is about building car culture with that specific kind of car enthusiast. Um, and six years later, we're 1.7 million subscribers. So definitely not an overnight success. It's regular, consistent work day in, day out for six, seven years. Yeah, so when we first started on YouTube, um, it was a simple Panasonic flip out camera. Um, I don't even think it shot in 1080, I think it might be in 720p. Um, and that was it. We had a couple of suction mounts, a Manfrotto tripod, um, no lighting, no rigs, no audio. Audio was actually one of the biggest things we struggled with early in the day. We, we struggled with wind noise out on location. We struggled with getting car exhaust noises. Things that we would consider now as extremely basic Back then we were like, how do we get rid of wind noise? Like it is like, all you can hear is like and it was just so annoying. So we had to, it was testing and iteration. Um, and then we basically started to step up. So then we, we spent more money on kind of professional camcorders. Um, then we moved up now to the Sony FS7, which shoots slow-mo as well, which just gives us kind of those really nice shots whenever we're doing like cars doing burnouts or cars going through the desert or cars going through water. Um, secondary camera, we have Sony a7S, a variety of different lenses, um, a variety of different mics, directional, um, lapel, lighting, the whole, the whole lot. Um, I, we're probably not at the stage yet where we, everyone is shooting on red epics, but again, I think honestly, it's all about the content. You can shoot on the most amazing camera rigs and you can get 10 views or you can shoot on a phone and get millions of views. And I think social media has proven that. It doesn't matter what you shoot on, so long as the content is something that people want to watch, it doesn't matter what it's shot on. There was definitely a point on the channel where we noticed an acceleration in terms of views and subscribers. And it was round about the point that we started embracing like meme culture. So for a long time, we put our own spin on, on what we thought popular humor was without really delving into what actual popular humor was. 
And as soon as we started to do that, there was one, one video that kind of springs to mind, which was with um, Roman Grosjean. And it was an interview that Alex had with Roman Grosjean, but we overlaid like subtitles and meme text on top of it. And it wasn't huge. It got, it got 20,000 views in like the first couple of days, which for us was um, the, the fastest growing video we ever had. And then straight after that, the next video was seven or 10 things you, you didn't know about your Honda S2000 or 10 things you should know about a Honda S2000. And that got 100,000 views extremely quickly. And again, it was a listicle based format, which makes it easier for people to follow on social media who are starved of time, who have massive attention deficit disorder. And it was fun content, but also it was educational content. So it ticked all of the boxes. There were things like, if you snip that wire, it means that you can, the, you can do the roof folding at speed. Like things that you really wouldn't know unless you've lived with that car. And that was when we were like, okay, that is the holy grail. How do we reverse engineer from that? And then you started to see things like seven things you didn't know about the BMW E46 M3 or seven, multiple X things about X or these are the 10 most insane um, rally saves you might have seen. All overlaid with our kind of meme style humor. And that basically skyrocketed us from 10,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers in the space of like a couple of months. And then from there, it was a very quick snowball effect to get to a million subs. But we then started to evolve the programming that we were doing. So it wasn't just meme videos. It was real, what we called that original content, uh, programming-based content. Alex's Project MX5 was the first project series we did. And that was really the start of the project builds that we did, which then have taken us through to like Project IS200, where we custom built a track car, uh, which was actually sponsored by eBay and then just experimenting with all of these different types of shows. But yeah, that for me, looking back, that was when I just first remembered thinking, shit, this could be something big. We always had a vision for Car Throttle that we would be a cross-platform media company, which basically means that we are on every single platform that's relevant for our millennial car enthusiast audience. So the website came first. We spent a lot of time building up this platform, technology, um, apps on iOS and Android. Um, in hindsight, probably wasn't the best move that we made because we were essentially building a Facebook for cars and the Facebook for cars is Facebook. So, um, but it was a great learning process and actually we built a lot of tools that we use today. So for example, we have these like video curation and creation tools that we use. We have these editorial tools that we have to create great content. Um, but the biggest learning actually is go where your audience is. Uh, we, we say that the most important thing that you do is give content distribution. Distribution trumps everything. If you have your channels of distribution, your channels of reaching people locked down and you can control that end to end, you actually can serve any content you want through those pipes. Now, Facebook and Google will always own the actual pipe, copper pipes themselves, but if you control the flow of water through those pipes, that means that eventually you can serve whatever you want to those final users, which has proven very useful now because as we, we're starting to move into a world of transactional um, media, so creating content that leads to a sell of a product or a good, we can actually now start to control what we sell to this audience. We can start to understand what it is that they want because they're communicating with us as well as us communicating with them. And that was always the premise of the cross-platform company, which is actually as a community, it's two-way. The conversation goes both ways. If they want to tell us something that they think is incorrect, they are able to via the platform, YouTube comments, emails. If we want to ask them what they want to see next, we can poll them, we can send them through to websites where we can kind of aggregate their opinion, all kinds of stuff. And that makes us a lot stronger than a traditional company, which is one directional. Um, so the cross platform, honestly, is the most important part for us. It means that, you know, sometimes on YouTube, you'll have a bad month. Videos don't hit the spot. You don't get the views you thought you were going to get. But on Facebook, we might have an amazing month or in e-commerce, we might have a great month or, you know, Snapchat might have taken off for us or Instagram stories might prove to be the thing that is popular. So um, that's the difference between us and a traditional YouTube company. Uh, we're very much not just YouTubers. We are a media company. And because of that, we will exist everywhere where media needs to be. How we like to promote and use each of those social platforms to build the YouTube platform is to consider it all as one big kind of flow diagram. So we will publish a YouTube video. We will then link from Facebook to carthrottle.com, 
where we then embed that YouTube video because we know it performs better than a Facebook link to YouTube. So it's all about how do you optimize the flow when you know that something works better than others. So for example, Instagram story swipe up is actually a lot more effective than an Instagram post with a link in the bio. Once you know that, you can start to go, right, actually I'm gonna promote my YouTube video via an Instagram stories as opposed to just create, um, putting an image of some behind the scenes of the shoot to just build the awareness of the video going out so that when then someone's scrolling through their YouTube timeline, they'll go, oh, I remember that there was this image of Alex um, reviewing that car two weeks ago. I'll, I'll actually go and watch that video. And that's the great benefit of having these platforms because people don't spend 100% of their time on YouTube. They spend 20% of their time on YouTube, 30% of their time on Facebook, 30% of their time on Instagram, 10% of their time on Snapchat, 10% of their time on email. And if you can control all of those methods of reaching those users, you can remind them about, remind them about content they might have missed. And you can essentially remarket those videos over and over again. And you stay top of mind, which for any brand is the most important part. And the best way of seeing it is real life. When we meet car throttle fans or Alex is around and car throttle fans come up to us, the number one thing I always ask is, how did you find out about car throttle? And the answers are always varied. For some people, they saw it in the app store. For some people, it was a Facebook page. For some people, it was through car memes. For some people, it was through YouTube. And it's so varied, that means that we have so many of those touch points in people's lives, which I like the most, because that's how you really build a brand. And ultimately, that's the biggest value that we have, which is a brand that supersedes us as individuals and as people. It, it exists actually more in the audience's lives than it does in our lives because they interact with it at every single touch point of their day. And that's actually where you build the most value. I, I took a risk with car throttle in hindsight because I graduated from university and I could have probably gone into the world of banking and finance. That was my, what my degree was kind of setting me up to do. But I actually said, look, let me take a year out of uh, going into corporate life and give it a shot. So I moved back home. I basically commuted from my bed to my desk in the same room. That was my commute, uh, which is a lot easier than it is now. And I just went to work for nine months. And I set myself a target of saying, by the 12th month, if I can make a full-time proper income out of this, which for me, I think I wanted to earn a couple of grand a month. That was my target. Um, I'll continue to do this full time. And it wasn't necessarily like a, a straight linear or hockey stick growth. A lot of it was flat growth. And I remember kind of November, December time of that, that period where I was going into it for the first year. So four or five months into it, we'd had three or four months of no growth. And I got really worried. I was like, shit, what are people gonna think about me? I took this risk, I'm gonna be laughed at. Um, this was a failure, I'm going to be a failure for the rest of my life. And it, it really like it actually made me think, what's the worst that's going to happen? The worst that's going to happen is, thankfully I have a degree, I'll just go and get a job again. The worst that's going to happen is people probably forget after six months and go, oh, I remember when you had that little project or that little blog that didn't work out. Well, at least you gave it a go. And that liberated me because that meant that actually I, I literally gave no shits about anything. And for the next four months, hustled hard, started to grow traffic again. And then just coming up to the 12 month mark, uh, we raised money from a VC firm called Passion Capital. And the idea behind that was we wanted to accelerate very quickly hiring staff because we could see this vision of becoming top gear for the Facebook generation. So I hired Alex, Ethan came on board shortly after that and we set about building this vision and they were already, or well, Ethan actually graduated from uni and joined us full time and he was freelancing through university. Alex had a full time job and joined us. And we were all systems go. It was, it was that 24 seven life from day one. So that was back in 2012. And uh, yeah, haven't looked back since. Yeah, sure. So one of the most important things that I set out as my goal, specifically for media is that we needed to become a profitable company because media is very um, fast changing. It's also quite a fickle industry as well. Uh, advertiser money can move very quickly from platform to platform, from publisher to publisher. And I decided early on that I didn't want to have that kind of um, organizational stress where we were worried about, you know, what's gonna happen next month, what's gonna happen next month. 
um, because we definitely went through those periods as well. So the investment allowed us to scale up to get to a point where then we could actually monetize at scale. So we were able to get to tens of millions of video views per month, which meant that we could win those bigger contracts. Once we won those bigger contracts, we then were able to start eking towards profitability. And now we've been profitable for the last six, seven months, um, which has essentially meant that now we're in adding cash mode, which means that it's just a lot more comfortable. We can focus on where do we want to invest? What are the opportunities that we can see? Um, but more than that, we've been sure to just be very um, careful about distributing revenue. So we don't tend to have one big lump revenue source coming in every single month. We have revenue split across branded content, pre-roll, post-roll, um, e-commerce, uh, all the way through to um, creation services for brands. And because of that, we have this kind of nice system where some months revenue might be higher in some areas, might be lower in some areas, but it tends to balance out and you get that now consistency that we've always been aiming for as a media company. So investment helped us to scale, but the focus on profitability was the key part for us in, in making sure that we're going to be around for the next X number of years. The one thing that I wish I'd known looking back now, we always say that we don't want to live a life with regrets here and we don't regret anything that we've done. But in hindsight, and the one thing that I'd give as advice for people watching is to be ruthless with ambition. I think particularly here in the UK, people don't set their goals high enough. And there's this mentality here in Britain where we're afraid to think that we can change the world. When in reality, we can. And you see this a lot when you go over to America and we're, we're lucky to, to work over in the States a lot of the time. But the mentality is different. They have this mentality of we can be the biggest in the world and we can revolutionize this industry. Here in the UK, a lot of people are just content with saying, you know, we can probably be the, the biggest car blog. Or we can probably be the, the fifth biggest car YouTube channel. What's the point? Like, why bother even setting a goal that's not the biggest and the best it could possibly be? Now, we always had the goal of being top gear for the Facebook generation, but we could have been more aggressive in how we got there. Um, and knowing what we know now, we can accelerate a brand from nothing to kind of world class in a year. And the biggest experiment we did was with WTF1. That was a brand that already had a cult following, but it had no video or, or commercial or brand facing aspect whatsoever. And we put all of that in place and we grew nearly all of the channels now to 100,000 followers, subscribers, fans, whatever it is, um, doing multiple millions of video views per month and starting to work with some amazing brands and actually interviewing pretty much nearly all of the drivers on the grid who now follow WTF1. So I think now we've become experts at, at brand acceleration. Uh, we can take pretty much any brand we want and turn it into a high flying brand that can make money and is profitable. And to be honest, I think for the future, that's just an incredibly important set of skills to have, knowing how to, to manage, to grow, to create and to monetize in a world where a lot of people complain about oh, monetization is so difficult. But actually, if you know how to approach sales and if you really understand what it is that brands are looking for, then it becomes actually quite easy because brands are looking for a lot of things. Most of the time, it's not just a nice video. It is sales or views or some form of KPI that unless you really dig down deep into it, you never understand what it is. So message to 21 year old me would be, be more aggressive and set your sights a bit higher and change the world and think that you can change the world within the next three years because it's 100% possible. So we have a, a number of different steps and goals, I guess, to give you a, a, an overview of them. Um, the main thing is how do we reach every single car enthusiast in the world? And outside of that, how do we reach every single person in the world that isn't an enthusiast, but has a touch point with the car world? Whether it is a purchase point, they're going to buy something, buy a new car, buy a car part, buy some new tires, um, get around in terms of just general transportation. Um, how do we build a brand that reaches them? And then how do we work with brands who want to reach that audience in a more effective way? And not only from an advertising point of view, but from a transactional point of view. And how do we start to own more of that purchase funnel? And we're already starting it right now. We launched our e-commerce business in March. It's now a huge part of our revenue stream. Um, we're starting to sell things like car care, car parts. Uh, we will start moving into other forms of products as well. 
Um, and the aim simply being that if you are a, an enthusiast or you're gonna buy something in and around the car world, we want you to buy it through us, whether it is through Car Throttle or a number of other brands that we will own. Um, so it's very simple, domination in the car world. <laughs> awesome. Brilliant, well thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Awesome.